again, welcome. We're so glad you're worshiping with us tonight. My name is Lindsay Jacoby. If we haven't gotten a chance to meet, we would love to continue worshiping by reading God's word. We are going to continue in our series through the first four chapters of Joshua called Get Going. So if you've been with us, you've been tracking along. We are going to be in Joshua chapter three tonight. So feel free to follow along in your copy of God's word. The words will be up on the screen for you to follow along there as well. Before we do that, I'll invite you to go to the Lord in prayer with me. Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Joshua chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today, I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. And that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off. And stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark of the, of the Covenant reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan where the water flowing down the Sea of the Arabah was completely cut off. And so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. I'll say the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jacoby. Well, I'll say bless the Lord if you'll say, oh, my soul, bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Um, Thanks for making it tonight. I know this is a new rhythm for all of us, four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm glad you guys didn't sleep in. That joke doesn't work anymore, does it? Um, It never did in the first place, Dad. All right, great. Uh, I'm Chris, I'm the pastor here, um, and I'm delighted to open up God's Word. We just read uh, an entire chapter of Scripture out loud, and it was a fantastic series, so congratulations, brownie points in heaven for lots of Scripture. Um, We've been walking through Joshua chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 in a series called Get Going. Joshua chapter 1, say yes. Joshua chapter 2, show mercy. Joshua chapter 3 this evening is simply step in and stand still. Step in and stand still. It's an epic moment for the children of Israel in their history, right? This is long before, right, a 44-year-old George Washington general crossing the ice-choked river called the Delaware on December 25th. 
Christmas night in 1776. Epic, but not as epic as this. Long before Julius Caesar, right, he's crossing the Rubicon with the 13th Legion back in like 42 BC. I don't even know, know the date was, but it was cool. Um, if you were there, it was awesome. You should have seen it. And he's got that famous line before he crosses the river, the die is cast. Here we have Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses is in turn stepping up into his leadership position and this is his coming out party for everyone in Israel to see if he can actually fill the shoes of Moses and his bold prophetic declaration rips off the pages for me when he says, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So that's what I want, right? Is that what you want? Don't we want these moments in our life when what matters most really matters? This epic crossing, this stepping in and standing still and the Lord providing, protecting and leading us all the way. We wanna be able to say, look, God is real. He is the living God in heaven and earth and he has proved himself faithful and true again and again. Actually, I don't think we want this moment. We want the moment after the moment, right? We want to have had crossed the Jordan. We don't want to cross the Jordan. As an author friend of mine likes to put it, no one likes writing. Everyone loves having written. This is what I feel like a lot of times in our life of discipleship and faith. We want discipleship. We just don't want discipline. We want community. We just don't really want to deal with the conflict that comes with it. We want Christ. I don't know about that cross. We want to follow Jesus except when Jesus is going to the Jordan and it's time for us to follow after him. I think we all want prayer and to see miracles, but do we want to fast? I think we all want to know God and feel that he's near, but do we even open up our Bibles? So if we want the moment, we have to want the moment that comes before the moment. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among us. Okay, consecrate yourself. Awesome, let's do it. What is it? One of those bold, just great words that come off of scripture and I'm like, absolutely not sure what it means. But it sounds really, really cool and I'd love to be a part of a band that sings like that, okay? What, I don't know, what is, what is consecrate, right? Is it a new protective shipping company that's an upstart? Maybe we'll invest in them with Bitcoin, I don't know. Is it a new restaurant in East Nashville? Because all you need is an arbitrary name and a cool location, and boom, you're raking in millions of dollars, right? Is it a new Christian rapper ready to come out, consecrate that we just haven't heard yet? Maybe he drops on Spotify in a couple of months. I don't know. It's something else. And I'm trying to listen and lean in, and as I'm praying and, and researching, all of a sudden, in the back of my medulla oblongata is me inside of a church in the mountains of Pennsylvania where I grew up with maybe 20 or so families singing at the top of their lungs. And my pastor, who also was the worship leader, bounded it out on white and black keys, a hymn that was sung graciously but out of tune. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, unto thee. Ah, now we're getting closer. You know who wrote that hymn? Francis Harvagas. She lived in the 1800s. She was the daughter of a minister. She was wicked smart. She knew Greek and Hebrew and two other languages. She memorized the entire book of Psalms, the entire book of Isaiah, and most of the New Testament. And she wrote poetry. And she wrote songs. And this was one of them. And she was said to say, maybe unite our congregational voice so that when we sing, we can feel the smile of God. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, unto thee. She died single at the age of 42. And we're still singing her songs today. Consecrated, the root word of which is holy. So God is holy and he's asking us to be holy. Yeah, to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It means, hey, I need to be set apart for a specific purpose. I, I, I've got to get ready for what God is doing. He's going to do amazing things, but if I don't keep step with him, I'm either going to miss it or I'm going to manipulate it. 
So I need to be set apart, sacred, holy, other, distinct, unique, set aside for a specific purpose, understanding that God is calling me, beckoning me into a life where there's flourishing and risk and danger. It's what we want, right? We want to be earth-shaking, disciple-making, right? People and pastors who don't care what the world is offering, but we're saying, Lord, if you will take my life and let it be consecrated unto thee, I'll go wherever it is that you are leading, even if it's straight into the raging waters of the Jordan. Now, make no mistake, you can't make yourself holy, okay? That's why we have what something called the gospel. It's good news. Hey, there's a holy God. We weren't. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Bible calls that condemned, okay? We were without God and without hope. But because of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, which, by the way, thank you for worship leaders and song lyrics that sing the full counsel of scripture before the pastor ever stands up and opens up his mouth. That's what we've just been singing about. That through Jesus Christ, we have now been made holy, baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We have sinners who have become saints, the Holy One, the Hagias of Christ. Now, consecration is merely our response to God's initiation of his holiness. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow he will do amazing things in your midst. Now, how did they get ready for this moment? Because it's a big deal, right? I don't know about you. I, I don't wanna miss what matters most in my life. I was with a group of guys and we were discussing being at funerals and we were reading a poet together, David White, who made the observation, if you've ever been to a funeral, it's really cold and stiff when everyone reads out their resume and all their accomplishments, no matter how grand they are. But the second someone stands up and says, I'm gonna miss this person because they loved homemade telescopes, <laughs> pecan pie, right? Once you find what that person's love, then the room warms up. I don't know about you, I don't wanna spend my life building some sort of resume and grandiose definition of success that mattered the least for the people who mattered most to me. I want my life to be consecrated, holy, set apart to a definition of success that looks more like faithfulness than it does a bunch of trophies collecting dust on a shelf that no one cares about. So in the passage, I think there's four really fun steps that kind of get outlined here, and I'm gonna write them up here so hopefully it can um, solidify in our memory, and you guys take which ones are helpful for you. Verse three says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant pass before you, so let's do this. Is, th is this called a mnemonic device or what is it when you, an acronym, right? Is that, that correct? Okay, good. I went to school. I can't wait till I go to high school, Billy. <laughs> I'm about to spell clap out again. That's wrong. That's not what I was supposed to do. <laughs> Come on, Chris, get with it. So the first thing is we need to concentrate. Concentrate on what? Well, he says, when you see the ark, did I spell it right? Is it good? Thank you. When you see the ark of the covenant pass before you, well, how are you gonna see it? It's only if you concentrate on it. So a couple things to remind you of here. Ark of the covenant signifies the presence of God. What's inside of the ark? 10 commandments. Don't let the word of the Lord depart from your left or your right. Meditate on it day and night. You got a cup of manna in there, which is what? God's your provider. He's gonna continue to provide. And then you have Aaron's staff, which was a dead stick, but somehow miraculously, there was almonds shooting out the side. Why? Reminder, God brings life from death. So concentrate on the person and the personality of God. And remember who he is and what he's done for you so that he will do it again. When you consecrate yourself, you're concentrating your attention straight ahead on God's presence. Why does he have to tell them this? Because they've been camping at the Jordan River for three days straight. And by the way, it's flood season. So let's picture this, all right? You've got the Jordan River, which stretches for about 95 miles, okay? It starts at Mount Hebron, which is approximately 9,000 feet above sea level, flows down all the way into the Dead Sea, which is 1,300 feet below sea level, which makes it the fastest traveling river in the world for its size. And it's flood season which means it's the snow is melting and all the rains and the wadis are bringing into it. And so normally maybe 100 meters or 100 yards across, maybe four to 10 feet deep, 
is now probably a square mile straight ahead to cross, and it's probably 40 feet deep in certain spots. And because it's up over its banks, you don't have a sandy shore that you're camping on. You're in the midst of thick brush and bramble, and this river is raging behind you for three days. And the only thing you can think of is, I forgot my bathing suit. I don't wanna get wet. And the promises of God lie on the other side. So you gotta concentrate on the presence of God on this side if you are going to follow him. When you concentrate, you're saying to God, I'm looking for who you are, not at my circumstances. Because you're bigger and you can provide. So question for you is, is there anything in your life that's distracting right now from the presence of God? How do you need to consistently focus your attention on the God who was and is and is to come? Verse three again, when you see the Ark of the Covenant pass before you and the priests who are the Levites, I don't know why he's clarifying who the priests are, but maybe he's just like, hey, you recognize the Levites, but now they're dressed up, so don't, don't be weirded out when dad's in a suit. When you see the priests who are the Levites carrying, you are to move out from your possessions. Concentrate, liquidate. It is a sad and sacrilegious day when Jesus beckons us to follow him and we say, no thanks, I like my stuff more than I like you. It's a sad day when we don't know who we are because we're shopping our identity out to any brand or person that will tell us who we are rather than the children of God. And it's sad that most of us We're really not following Jesus. We've just baptized our own agendas and American dreams of wealth and prosperity and ask God to give it to us. And if he doesn't work, we'll try something else. Liquidate anything that's keeping you from following God. Come out, move out from all of your possessions. Because what you'll realize, if you're not moving and following God, then your possessions have possessed you. And that's not where we wanna be. We wanna be free and fully alive. And we wanna be able to follow the Lord wherever he goes with open hands that says, Lord, whatever you wanna trust me with, I will use for your kingdom and for your cause. When I get in trouble is when God gives me something and I said, uh-uh, don't take it back. Mm-mm, I can't release that. And I get standing on the shore paralyzed by fear and doubt that my God's not good and that he doesn't own the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. But he knows every need I have of even before I ask it. That's the God who I'll liquidate every bank account, every relationship, every possession in order to follow onto the other side of the Jordan River to possess his promises and live fully into them. What needs to be liquidated in your life tonight for you to fully follow Jesus? What possession has your obsession right now? Is there something that you need to let go of in order to embrace the calling God has for you? When you see the Ark of the Covenant pass before you and the priests who are the Levites carrying it, you're to move out from your possessions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. All right? So now we're at anticipate. Anticipate. Should have practiced those my spelling. Anticipate. There we go. You've got to anticipate the movement of God in your life. It is a holy curiosity. Is it a raising of the expectations of the room? It's coming into a collective corporate worship gathering and going, Lord, I'm expecting to hear from you and to meet with you. That for some reason, when we choose to notice God, all of a sudden we're more aware of the fact that he's on the move. It's a silly illustration, but it works. Have you ever bought a different car and all of a sudden you're on the road and going, I didn't know everybody had this car. Why? Because now you're aware of it. Your anticipation brings out a new awareness for you. 
uh, about four or five years ago. I inherited my father-in-law's Jeep. I did not know there were that many Jeeps on the road. And they're all weird and they wave to each other. Like I can't even daydream on my commute anymore. I gotta make sure I'm not rude and waving. And then it just gets really weird. Like you just, it's just, is it two fingers? Is it a wave out here? Make sure my foot's out here because that's what the really cool people do. And it's just like, ah, it's too much. All right, hello to all of you Jeepers. See you. Consecration heightens our anticipation because we have to honestly and humbly say, I've never been this way before. I gotta anticipate, if you don't make a way, Lord, I'm screwed. Like, where is the joy and the honesty and the humiliation, which is a great word in the Christian tradition, okay? It's not something we avoid, it's something we embrace. Humiliated literally means brought low to the ground where I've got to get on my hands and my knees and on my face in prayer and say, Lord, I don't have a clue where I'm going and I don't know what to do next. But if I anticipate you will go, I'll follow in your footsteps. I'm not going to get ahead of you. I'm not going to trail behind you, but I've never been this way before. I need your help and I'm anticipating you coming at just the right time. And I don't know why I thought it would be different following Jesus rather than when I came to Jesus because I was humiliated when I had to come to Jesus, right? I had to realize, oh my gosh, I was condemned. I was without hope. I didn't know who God was. He illuminated his need for me. Okay, great. I have nothing without you. It's only by your blood that I'm actually approaching you. That's good. Why did I think my sanctification would be different? This is Colossians 1.21 reminding us, once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Sit there, someone. Because the accuser is still accusing. But Jesus' blood bought the right to silence those accusations. You're without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, step in and stand still, congregation, with holy anticipation. Where do you humbly need to admit tonight, I've never been this way before? And where do you need to anticipate the Lord going before you and making a way? Concentrate, liquidate, anticipate, and then participate. That's a big one, right? Because most of us fall short here. This is not just hearing the word of God, but obeying it. This is faith and works. It's time to jump in. When you see the Ark of the Covenant pass before you and the priests who are the Levites carrying it, move out from all your possessions and follow it, follow it, follow it. Get going, right? This is clap. This is a slow clap. Everyone's gonna start slow clapping, right? It's in every John Hughes movie from the 80s, all right? After Patrick Dempsey makes a great speech and the jock finally lets him in to be popular, right? We're slow clapping. And when everybody's slow clapping, there's the first dude who claps on the offbeat. That's usually me, I admit it. But you're waiting, everyone finds the rhythm. And by the time everyone's in, then it speeds up, right? There's this anticipation, there's this participation, and now it's time to step forward into that new future, right? Here we go. You've got to look for the Lord moving out for you. Get in, step in, and stand still. Now, Joshua tells this this is interesting, folks. This is interesting, and I'll I'll try to wrap it up here, but I'm I'm getting fired up. (laughs) Joshua looks at the people and does not collectively tell them to individually follow God. He individually asks them to collectively follow God. What are you making a big deal out of, Chris? What I'm saying is let's stop strip mining the gospel and scripture for our own consumeristic, narcissistic agenda wherein I ask God to bless all the plans for my life to prosper myself. The gospel is only lived out in the context of a collective community and a congregation called the church in which I set aside my own narrative, thank you, Wade, and I embrace a communal narrative which means my personal preferences are just that, preferences. So when will we become unified long enough together to go, what is God collectively calling us to do right here in the city of Nashville to set up an outpost of the kingdom of God where someone looks and goes, wow, with that group of people on earth as it is in heaven, they've moved out from their possessions They probably don't have a clue what they're doing, but God is moving in their midst. 
They concentrate, they anticipate, they liquidate, and they participate in what God is doing in and among them. I want to be a part of that. I want to ask you this question. Where is Christ asking you to participate in a community so that we can move together? Where do you have to set aside your own personal preferences sometimes and embrace conflict and broken people and bad breath and things that you wish were just different to go, you know what? This is what it looks like when my family gets together. And together, we're gonna step in and we're gonna stand still. Consecrate yourself for the Lord will do amazing things among us. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The only thing predictable about God is he's notoriously unpredictable. Everybody there would be waiting for him to do the same thing that he did at the Red Sea through Moses. He's got bad timing because it's flood season, right? He could have done it. Don't we all just want to wait till the conditions are perfect to follow God? But instead he does it during the flood season. And the priests who are the Levites, that's <laughs> great, this could be in my head forever. The priests who are the Levites are carrying the ark and it says they have to get up to the edge of the water and stand still. And you know what happens in that moment? Nothing. Like, can you imagine that? All of Israel, you got 40,000 men armed for war. You got 60,000 women and children waiting, like, hurry up, let's get this carpool movement. You got a little precocious little toddler who says just a little bit too loud to his mommy, nothing's happening, what's wrong? <laughs> Joshua hears it. And he squints his eyes and he pinches his temples because the migraines of accusation that he's not Moses. And he's missed it. And he's done something wrong. He's got to burn it out. He looks at the priests and they have the same look in their face. The lactic acid in their calves are building up, leaning into that current. For some reason, the, co the Ark of the Covenant feels heavy on their shoulders, but it looks really small compared to the river. And nothing's happening. They step in and they stand still. But that's not the whole story, is it? What can they never know? That the second the soles of their feet touched the water, nine miles upstream, the Lord stopped the river. It was just going to take about five or ten minutes for them to see evidence of his miracle. Do you know what the Lord is doing upstream in your life right now if you'll just step in and stand still? Amen. So we want to preach the Bible clearly. Give your soul some space to respond. I'll ask Jacoby to come up and just kind of walk us through a guided prayer. We just want to let you sit and marinate in God's word. And hopefully our worship leads us to obedience.